All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we got a, a small crowd. Hopefully more people will keep rolling in. Uh, but today is another session of our, our stupid question series. And so this question came to us from really there was a, a pretty long forum thread going in the email there about, you know, what are the actual costs of spraying now? And, you know, given those different costs, you know, how do we justify some of the different sprays that we might be using, whether it be a, a biological product for fire blade or, or some of these other organic sprays that might be out there um, that we might need to be putting on separate applications for. And then finally, we'll also talk about, you know, how future precision spraying technologies in the future might be able to help us bring some of these costs down. So I'm really happy today we're being joined by Allison DeMarie of DeMarie Fruit Farms. We've also got Jason DeVoe from Omafra on to talk about the future technology for precision spraying. And so I think we're just going to go ahead and jump in and really try to tackle our first question, uh, which I'll direct mostly to Allison. You know, what really is the current cost per acre to run an air blast through an orchard? So Allison, what, uh, what do you think? Well, it's gonna vary for every farm. That's, once I started doing this, I realized this is a more challenging question than, uh, than, I'm, than I could prepare in a short amount of time. So I don't know, is my spreadsheet up right now? If you yep, can, we can see it. Okay. So um, the first thing I wanna talk about why growers don't figure this out. And the first thing I did was I looked at all of our tractors, what we had paid for them and how many hours we were using them. And we have tractors from 2007 to 2022. Um, the main thing that you have to know is that you need a tractor with probably 75 horsepower in order to um, do a PTO sprayer today. So I contacted Butch McQueen to ask him what the current price of a tractor is. So the one he quoted to me is listed on here, um, the New Holland uh, 4 110 F tractor. He sent me all kinds of literature on it. So if anybody wants it, I can send that to them. Um, but he said that he would be selling it for 85000 so if you look here, I put the purchase date as today, the purchase price of 85,000. Um, he told me, it was also interesting because on our farm, if something gets close to 5,000, 6,000 hours, we trade it in and get a new tractor. But he told me that new tractors today could have an expected life of seven to 9,000. So I used 7,000. And part of the reason I used that was because you might not use that tractor for spraying. You might end up, you know, if you're really using a tractor hard and you're at the full horsepower all the time, it's gonna wear out faster. And our, our farm, we have a lot of hills. Um, and so you might not be getting the horsepower out of that tractor as it gets older. But I did put in here expected hours of life at 7,000. So the cost, basically what you're doing is you're um, looking at what you paid for the tractor minus what you can trade it in for at the end of its life. And Butch told me anywhere from 10 to 15,000. So I picked 12,000. So the net cost is 73,000. And then once you divide it by the 7,000 hours of life, it's $10.43 per hour. And that's not taking into, a, into account um, inflation or anything else. That would be like what you're charged for the life of, of the tractor. Um, and then the same thing with sprayers. We have on our farm right now, we have a Munkoff sprayer <clears throat> um, that we bought in 2015. At that time, it cost 80,000. Now, um, 
I know they're well over 100,000. And my husband likes to get all the little extra things in it. So <clears throat> I put down a price of 110,000. The salvage value I just guessed at, and I was, I'm figuring on all of our sprayers that they're gonna last about 20 years. So the net cost of a Munkoff is 104,000. And I just put down 4,600 hours of life and kind of based on um, how much we're using it in our business. We have four sprayers running so that we can get the entire farm sprayed in nine and a half hours. And Munkoff is doing the equivalent of three rows at a time. It covers 70 acres and it gets that done in eight hours. And then the other three tower sprayers, um, they usually operate for nine and a half hours and they're each covering 40 acres. So you can see from this little chart um, what equipment we're using and you know what the, the cost is based on the tractor. The Aerofan, I just put it the same price as the Rears Tower Sprayer. That Rears Tower Sprayer is what Butch, um, Butch McQueen told me last night. Um, and I'm not really sure what a current Aerofan is, but um, ours is old enough that I, I wanted to use a more current cost. But I want to show you if, if you drop the hours of expected life, say they're 6,000, but you see the, the tractor, 6,000 hours of life, it's going to change that ownership 12, 17. So it depends a lot on the farm and how they take care of their equipment. Um, so that was the first thing I encountered. You're going to see growers that can do this for cheaper because, you know, they might have older equipment. Um, the other thing I didn't, I didn't put in here at all is how much, um, how much it costs to maintain this stuff on an annual basis. And I talked, we have two full-time people and every spring, before the spray season starts, two people spend four and a half hours um, servicing the tractor and the sprayer. And that's going through and greasing everything, oiling everything, um, cleaning all the nozzles. I didn't, so I don't have that in here. Um, I know that we replace all the filters in our tractors. We re replace the uh, cab filters. Um, in the cabs. So I, I didn't include any of that. It would, it would take me more time to figure all that out. Um, but I want to, I also just want to show you um, the other thing that I did stick in, did stick in here. Uh, I know on our farm, my husband said that um, we use about 30 gallons of diesel fuel per tractor per day. And I don't know if, with the Munkoff if that's slightly different or the same, but um, so the diesel cost per tractor at $5 per gallon for diesel is $150 or the cost per day to run all the sprayers is $600 just in diesel fuel. When I have more time, when Bonnie gets on board, I'll work with her to um, put this in a different form so it's easier to figure out. Figure out. That's, I mean, this is amazing, Allison. <laughs> Thank you for putting the time into this. I guess I'm curious. Um, so you talked about some of those those fixed operating costs with, with the tractors. What percentage of that makes up the total cost of your, your per spray, I guess? Um, you mean as far as like what we're spending on spray materials? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm I sure it's, have... it's very variable depending on what you're, you're putting out. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to think. I did figure out, let me just pull this up on... 
this isn't done yet, but I have, I'm starting to figure out what it costs us per acre to spray something. Mm -hmm. um, Okay. Make it easier to do it this way. Also mentioned that Jason, thank you for putting that in the chat box. He put in some calculations about um, coming up with the minimum tractor PTO horsepower requirement for a 500 gallon sprayer. As you can see that worked out. The math comes out to about 86 horsepower for the PTO. Thanks, Jason. Oh, don't thank me. Those are Mark's calculations. <laughs> I'll be sure to thank him too then. Okay, so I have some adjustments to make in this yet, but the reason why growers have a hard time giving you this information is because when they get to the end of their year, if they think they're going to make money, agriculture is on a cash basis, if they think they're going to make a lot of money and have to pay a ton of taxes, they will pre-purchase pre or they'll buy chemicals at the end of the year, hold them for the next year or they'll put a deposit down. So in order to figure out really what your spray expenses are per acre, just for materials, you need to make adjustments every year. Um, you need to look at what were my, what did I have in inventory at the beginning of the year? What do I have in inventory at the end of the year? So you can see for us, we spent 221,000 on chemicals. And once I make the adjustment, it's $911 per acre. Okay. Allison, I'm I'm still seeing um sort of the, the file selection on your Excel sheet. So it might be in a different window. Oh, okay. I don't know how to. You might need to stop sharing and then reshare the particular window that you selected or the document. Okay. Let's see. New share. Yeah. Yep, perfect. I did it. Okay, so here's spray chemicals. And our tax year ends at January 31st. So this is kind of a rough thing. I have to go through and check all my numbers, but you can sure. see um, we bought a lot of spray chemicals at the end of our year. So I had to adjust it down $45,000 or $46,000. Mm -hmm. And when I was doing farm business summaries, I saw a lot of people doing that. Um, you might also have people that somebody's holding credit on them and they still owe for last year's spray bill. Okay. Um, but that's why growers have a hard time figuring out what their costs are because they tend to do everything on a tax basis. And we try to put everything based on a crop year basis, what we actually spent on that crop. Okay. Hmm. But you can see our total expenses are about $11,463 per, per acre. Okay. We're mostly fresh fruit. Um, last year, we grew about 200,000 bushels of apples. And I would say probably 85% was fresh. The rest okay. was juice and processing. And mostly our processing apples, we do have a few varieties that are, they used to be fresh, but they've fallen out of favor like um, Jonagold's. Um, 
trying to think what else. Portland's um, Crispin. Mm -hmm. um, so we what we tend to do is if something's fallen out of favor, we process it if, if we can't find a fresh market for it, and then um, we'll replace it. And we're very aggressive in replacing in replacing uh, orchards. Sure. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the other screen. Control. I can get back there. <laughs> Hmm. No, it's gonna let me. You might need to do the un unshare and reshare again. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. Yep, you're back to your original one now. Okay, and the other problem in figuring out labor costs is on our farm, we have two full-time people that spray and two H2A workers. And in addition to their hourly rate, um, our guys get other benefits like health insurance, um, you know, of course, Social Security, we, we just pay on the uh, domestic workers. Unemployment, we just pay, pay on the domestic workers. Workers' comp, we pay on everybody. So um, I basically went in and figured based on hours what the additional cost for Social Security, unemployment, and workers' comp would be. So if you look, um, if you see this little chart on AgriTrack, we had 186 hours spent spraying for the month of April. And this was the exact cash cost. And then to that, you have to add workers comp. And then for other, I added health insurance. We have one guy that we pay health insurance on. Housing, everybody gets um, either reduced rent or no rent plus they also get things like uh, heating fuel, electricity, um, our cost of you know, repair, maintenance. And then for the H2A travel and subsistence, I had to kind of calculate that based on the people who come in early because there are sprayers and then take it down to an, um, an hourly basis. So what you see here on X, Y, and Z are all based on an hourly basis. And what I have listed here is total um, indirects I put under other. So this shows for each of these months what the other costs were based on the total number of hours. So this shows um, our total labor cost for each of these months for spraying. So for the whole season, it was about 22,453. Um, and when I put that on an hourly basis, um, it's $25.13. There are some things that aren't in there, you know, like the guys servicing the sprayers at the beginning of the season, um, draining the sprayers and, and preparing them so that nothing will freeze and break at the end of the season. Um, I don't have anything in there for repairs, um, replacing fuel filters and all the rest of it. 
I figure that's something we can work on for the future, but I just want to be able to give you some kind of figure for today. Um, if you look under the column for Social Security, Unemployment, Workers Comp, I figured for our farm, that's like 9.6% um, of whatever the cash labor cost is gets added on to that. That will vary for every farm and it's based on what your experience is. So if you have a lot of workers comp claims, it's gonna be a lot higher. Um, Social security is 0 0.0765, but you don't pay that on your H2A workers. You only pay it on your domestic workers. Um, and then workers comp, that's purely based on what your, what your history is. If you're, you know, if people are constantly getting hurt and you're taken to the hospital, that rate's gonna go way up. For us, I think it's around 11,000 a year. I've seen it as high as 30,000 for some farms. So all this is gonna vary per farm. The other thing I wanna point out is that this is the 2022 rate. Um, and expenses have gone way up. So here's what I, our guys, the 2022 rate, we had one guy at 1750, one at 1650, 1566 was the H2A rate last year. And this year we gave our full-time people a dollar and a half hour per hour raise. Um, and the H2A people got a dollar 29 raise. So, you know, there's 25, I mean, it's gonna go up more than a dollar 50 because all these other costs especially like, you know, the social security, the workers' comp, the unemployment, um, it's all based on percent of the hourly rate. So what you see here um, is actually the total number of hours we spent spraying last year. And that includes everything. We did 14, like standard sprays, but then, you know, we I think we have, uh, I don't know, like maybe 20 acres of Honeycrisp. So we did some calcium sprays. It wouldn't include the extra things. Not everything gets retained. So like when you see this September number and maybe even the August number, you've got some sprays in there that aren't included in that 14, the 14 standard sprays. Okay. Um, so the other thing I wanted to show you I wanted to show you the difference between our Munkoff and the power sprayers. So the Munkoff um, per spray is costing us six hundred and fifteen dollars. Per acre, it's eight dollars and seventy nine cents. and per hour, it's just under $77 per hour. The three towers, for, and that's, that's covering um, 70 acres, and it's eight hours every time um, we spray that 70 acres. The three tower sprayers, the total depreciation on those is about $601. The fuel is $450. The labor is $716, because you got three people and three sprayers. On a per acre basis, for 120 acres, that's $14.72 per acre. And on a per hour basis, it's $62 an hour. So I think the bottom line is, this is gonna vary for every single farmer based on the age of their equipment, how they do things, you know, how, um, how far they have to drive once they're done spraying to get back to the spray shed to refill. I asked our guys if they included when they're, you know, they have a, a basically their telephone where they're telling uh, AgriTrack what they're doing. So I said, okay, when you say you're spraying, does that include the fact that you're getting the sprayer ready and then you're cleaning the sprayer up afterwards? And they said, yes. Um, there might have been a few days, though, that maybe it did, wasn't included because if they get done at the end of the day, they try to help each other out. 
if they get done at the end of the day and it's really late, they might wait till the next day to, to uh, clean up their sprayer. And so I don't know if at that point they actually put in that that was you know spray time. Sure. So this just gives you an idea for our farm. Um, Hopefully I can work with Bonnie and we can put together a spreadsheet where everybody could put in their own information and figure out what it, you know, what it costs them. But I think it's interesting if you look at the Munkoff, because that really has made a big difference for us. Um, you know, we, we're pretty sure we're gonna buy a second one maybe as soon as next year. But the other thing you have to take into consideration is you have to have uh, enough turning room at the end of your rows. And we can use the monk off very easily on 12 feet between the rows. When we get 13 feet between the rows, it gets, you know, your operator has to be a little bit more careful. Um, our whole farm is surrounded by deer fence. And the very first time my husband took the monk off, off uh, or he took it out, he ran into the deer fence and he had about $500 worth of repairs. But we're seeing more and more growers in our area that are um, getting the monk off. And part of it is um, they're short on labor. It's really hard to find full-time people. It's also hard to find H2A workers who you would trust <laughs> using that kind of equipment who have the skills to use it. So our, we pretty much replanted our whole farm. There's maybe... 20 acres that's still at 16 foot spacings. Um, the majority of our spacings between the rows is 12 feet. We probably will not go below that just because every time you do, you got to change equipment. You know, you've got to replace your equipment. Sure. So I don't know if anybody has any questions or comments. Oh, sure. Well, well, first off, thank you so much, Allison, for putting in all this work. This is really fascinating for me to see this. I'm not I'm not really an economics person, so this is blowing my mind. So really appreciative of, of the work you put into this. I guess one question I would have right off the back is um so you're you're spraying 190 acres. Yeah. How much more given your current equipment do you think you you could be able to go up to to bring down those fixed costs on a, a per acre basis? Or do you feel like you're kind of maxed out with where you're at equipment wise? Well, I think what we talked about is if we go to a second Munkoff sprayer, um, we would get rid of one of the tower sprayers and that would let us cover more acreage. And some of the big farms around us now, you know, a lot of them bought one Munkoff sprayer. Now they've got a second one and we've got a couple people that have probably three or four. So being able to spray three rows at a time is huge, but you know, you have to invest a lot of money to get to that point. <laughs> sure. Yep. So I'm sure at that point, it's, it's sort of looking at, you know, buying that equipment and then kind of running through maybe a, like a full net present value over the next couple of years and, and seeing how it, it pans out. I mean, would, would that be one way to go about that or? I think labor is going to drive it more than anything else. Sure. Because if you see that one person is, is covering 70 acres in eight hours, um, and you got three people covering 120, you know, they're each covering 40 acres in an eight hour day or nine and a half hour day. We really want to try to get everything sprayed in one day because. You never know. I mean, we're right off of Lake Ontario, so sometimes it's too windy to spray. So this gives us a lot more options. Sure. And I think the other thing is my husband does a pretty good job of taking care of equipment, um, you know, maintaining stuff. He's, he's a real stickler about that. Where when I, uh, I talked to Butcher McQueen and I said, um, if a grower wanted you to service his equipment, his tractor and his sprayer to get it ready for the spray season, what would it cost him? And he basically told me that people don't do that. They just have their own staff do it. 
but there's usually what happens is they don't do stuff that they should do and then they have major breakdowns. So we've talked about once we buy another monk off, we might keep the tower sprayer around just as a backup sprayer in case anything happens because it doesn't take much for you to screw up those bags if you run them into something. Sure, yeah. So I'd like to invite anybody else have questions on, on this portion of the talk before we, we delve into the other two main topic areas. We were also planning to have Lynn Kine from Penn State join us today, and he's an ag economist, economist at there, um, but unfortunately he had a, a late meeting come up, so he wasn't able to, to join us uh, to talk about Pennsylvania data. Um, I do see Erica's on here too, not to throw you into the middle, Erica, I just wanted to see if you had any additional comments. I know you had sent over what Omafra put together about the sort of you know rough estimate of what it costs per acre. I uh, just wanted to see if you had any thoughts on how things might compare in Ontario versus what, what Allison's seeing here in her orchard. Um, yeah, so we're still working on our current cost of production. Um, I know as soon as it's done, I'll, I'll pass it over. But um, I'm not an economist either. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, House has been working with me to update our, um, our specific Apple cost of production. And, uh, Jason knows about all the new technology that's coming and that would definitely change it in the future. But we are seeing very similar things where, you know, uh, chemical uh, costs have increased a crazy amount. Labor is also difficult in Ontario. Um, and growers are looking for better ways to manage their acreage more precisely. So we are following that, that trend. And uh, yeah, I'm lucky enough to be visiting Allison this weekend, so we can talk in person and uh, get a bit of an update and, and share information. Um, but yeah, Allison has more firsthand knowledge than I do, um, so I'm I'm still learning, and I don't want to say anything regarding numbers because that's not my uh, my expertise right now. Certainly. So I think um, we can transition then into sort of that second question. And I, I think this is sort of really open to interpretation. And I think, you know, reiterates what Allison said, where each operation is going to be so different. It's it's really hard to come up with a blanket approach to, to some of these different issues that we're having. But I think that second question, just to, to frame it for us all again, was really coming out of our fire blight discussion last week, where we were talking about, you know, the the multitude of different products that we have available now, whether they be the ones that are uh, the SAR products, where we're ramping up the plant defenses, some of the different biological materials like Blossom Protect, where you can't apply that with a fungicide program because it'll cancel out Blossom Protect, of course. Um, uh, we also have the different PGRs, so using Apogee or Kudos to slow down shoot growth to try to help with fire blade too. And so I think, you know, the question came from someone along the lines of with the cost of spraying, you know, Allison, you mentioned that you pretty much run 14 sprays throughout the year, um, you know, and in, in, in your experience and for everyone here, you know, how much wiggle room do you have to add on some of these additional materials? Can you afford to add additional sprays? Um, and maybe we just kind of, talk about fire blade for now where uh, you know given all the, the other options available have you looked into to some of these other products or are you pretty much sticking with strep or um, I know that I just kind of asked five questions in one so we could <laughs> well, go ahead um, well sometime you should talk to my daughter Kristen because she's now our orchard manager and I know she has spent a lot of time this winter we grow over 20 varieties and she's putting together spray schedules based on problems each variety has. Um, I know that we've used several different things and at this point she's open to using anything. <laughs> um, one, I think it was two years ago, we had a new planting of Ludacris. We had no clue as to when Ludacris bloomed and it's a, it was a late bloomer. 
Uh, it sits right on the corner of our farm, the northwest corner. We literally lost half of the trees to fire blight. And by the time we realized the fire blight was in there, the trees were, the bark was oozing. Um, so the following year, we put in, we replaced half the block with interplants. Wow. We don't want to have another year like that. Um, we're surrounded by process growers. The only thing that separates us is like maybe 30 foot of woods. Um, so we constantly have fire blight blowing up, you know, in on our farm. And on our west side, we have a farmer, a process grower, who's literally, his trees looked like they were dead mushrooms. I mean, they were just all flagged, they were black, and he didn't have the help there to trim them. Um, so that's kind of what we're facing. And it's a lot, when you figure out what it costs to plant a tree and then replant it, it's much cheaper to put on a fire blight spray. And I do know that we, we do have, um, we've had our farm tested and we do have the strain of fire blight that's resistant. It's not everywhere, but it is in different places on the farm. Sure, so with that, are you, are you mixing in oxytet or casubamycin or how are you managing that? I don't think we've used casubamycin. Um, and actually you would have to ask my husband about that. Um, I could send you a copy of our spray records <laughs> <laughs> because that's something that I usually don't get involved in just because I'm too busy crunching numbers and doing other things. <laughs> <laughs> sure, because you got, <clears throat> you got extension agents like me asking you to, to help <laughs> us out. <laughs> well, um, I would, you know, not to call, call people out here, but Janet, I'm wondering if, if you, might want to chime in on just what your general perception is of what you're seeing in Western New York, just about the adoption of some of these other tools and if you have any sense. Um, sure, yeah, thanks. Uh, I guess I'm not sure exactly where you're hoping that, or if it's just sort of like a, a broad general question, um, like where are you specifically referring to fire blight or just, just generally or, sprayer, or fire blight, um, sprayer adoption? Yeah, for those some of the different materials that are out there, if you have a, a general sense yeah. for your conversations. Um, I would say, I mean, as as everything in Western New York, it really is pretty varied by by grower. Um, there's just such a wide range of what we have going on um with different growing styles and different sort of historical cultural practices um of the, the grower community. But I would say that there is quite a bit of adoption of some of those alternative methods. The Apogee is one that we've been pushing pretty hard. And I think especially with Anna doing some of her research trials up here, um, one that the growers up here are fairly familiar with. Um, I hear some folks asking about some of those other uh, biologicals like the Blossom Protect and um, Regalia and stuff like that. I think I think maybe folks have dabbled, but they're not getting quite as much traction from what I'm seeing. Sure. Um, I guess I would also, this is not fire blood anymore, but in terms of like the different sprayer technologies, especially, you know, the monk cough is one that we hear about fairly frequently. And I would say there's increasingly quite a bit of interest in that or other sprayer systems like that, that I'm hearing from folks. Um, of course, you know, the, the Allison DeMarie's, the early adopters, but then also some of the folks that maybe I wouldn't have expected that to be on their radar necessarily. So I think there's definitely a lot of interest sort of in where that's a good fit and which, you know, growers are wondering if it's a good fit on their farm. So excited to hear more about that. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I can give sort of at least my my Champlain Valley perspective. I mean, I'll just reiterate what's what Janet said and what Allison said. It certainly does seem to vary farm to farm. And I think to the point where it, it really depends on how bad you have that fire blight outbreak too, right? Um, as Allison said, it, it probably is gonna cost a lot less to put on another spray than it is to replace that orchard. Um, so I think a lot of people are thinking in, in those terms. I would say from the resistance management point too, in farms where we've seen resistance starting to pop up, people are definitely thinking about tank mixing in some of those other materials like casubamycin or oxy. Similarly, I, I haven't heard a lot of people using the biological materials. Um, I, th I think I've heard a few people that might be thinking about trying out ActiGuard, but I haven't heard much about Blossom Protect. 
And I would say the apogee is, is being adopted maybe more so uh, in Honeycrisp because of the potential for the reduction in bitter pit. But I think growers see, you know, sort of getting the the multiple action of that as slowing down their bitter pit and also helping with fire blight. So I think people are adopting that more. And certainly sort of post-infection when it comes to shoot blight, um, if it's a really bad infection and they're seeing a lot, people are going out pretty frequently and they're going to be putting out copper and double nickel up until terminal bud set on a more or less weekly to every two week basis to try to keep that in check. So um, I think practically speaking from the growers that I work with, it is very much a, we need to do what we can to save the block so that we don't need a, to replant it. So it seems to be that's that seems to be the general mindset of people that I, I talk to in my region. Just want to see if anybody else had any thoughts on that. I I see we have Jeremy from New Hampshire on the call, and we also have Kathleen uh, wondering what you might be hearing from folks down in the valley from what you've been seeing about where people might might fall on, on this. Hey, Mike. Yeah, um, I'll just chime in briefly. I think pretty similar to what both you and Janet have said, you know, we have really done a lot of programming to kind of try to bring into the light the potential of some of those materials like Apogee, Actigard, and, and kind of some of those combinations that we're hearing from um, Michigan, George Sundin. Um, and so, you know, for the past couple of years here you know we've had two or three years here we've been battling some you know pretty serious fire blight infections on some farms and you know those are the ones I think that have paid particular attention to those newer options you know especially if they have younger trees that they're really trying to save or protect you know we've seen a lot of that going on and um, I think more and more paying attention to the potential for um, for apogee you know, to reduce, you know, shoot growth and try, you know, try that as a strategy um, to kind of help manage shoot strikes as we go in. Certainly copper is is pretty common, you know, throughout the season until terminal bud set. Um, you know, we, we hear double nickel mentioned, but I don't know a lot of growers who have adopted that to my knowledge in our area, uh, but certainly something I'm interested to kind of follow and, and hear, you know, if other growers are having success with that. Um, Blossom Protect, we hear pop up from time to time, um, but not, not a whole lot of adoption of that here to this point. Um, and to my knowledge, we don't have any of the resistant strains of fire blight, at least that have been identified in New Hampshire. But um, I'm going to make a point of letting folks know that sending those samples to, to New York this year is an option so that we can make sure that we're paying attention to that as well. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. Sure. And I see we we have Kathleen. She said she's in a noisy environment, so she's not gonna she's not gonna mute herself. And she said she pretty much is has similar thoughts to what's been said. Um, Erica did put in the chat. Has anyone tested out biopollen? Um, I'm not familiar with that one. Is anybody is anybody else with that one? I wonder if that's up. Do you know what the active ingredient? I was wonder if it's a Canadian version of something we would know. I'll look into it. Yeah, I don't know what the active is. Okay, thanks, Erica. All right, so if anybody else has any other thoughts on that, uh, please go ahead and, and chime in. But I think otherwise, I'd, I'd like to move us into sort of the the last stage of, of today's meeting and let Jason get some, some microphone time there. And I think we've kind of been touching on some of this now, you know, Allison, you mentioned you're, you're liking the number of results that you're seeing from the Munchkoff and we've got a, a farm up in my area with one and Janet mentioned a few other people. Um, but really Jason, where do you see the future of sprayer tech helping us out with some of these issues? I'm going to break the rules, Michael. Can I share my screen for a sec? Oof, I don't know, Jason. I don't know. Come on, buddy. Do me a solid. All right. I think we could do that. I'm so taken by what Allison shared. 
so I, I spray all kinds of stuff, which means I become a real generalist. I never drill down into the agronomy. I never get a chance to drill down into a, into a single kind of commodity to get as far as the economics. But everything Allison shared was really cool. Uh, predominantly, like primarily my interest is in the benefit of going to a multi-row sprayer. So while she was talking, I rushed back to Sprayers 101 where Dr. David Mangtolo, years ago, he created kind of an economic comparison calculator for the cost of spraying. And uh, I cleaned it all up and put it on Sprayers 101. And based on Allison's numbers, I'm just gonna show you what I saw. And it's no surprise. If I were talking to a field sprayer operator, their desire is to drive faster to improve productivity. But that tends not to have as big an impact as other things they could do, filling faster, uh, reducing their time to get to the job, um, uh, having a boom that's longer so they have less passes. And by that same token, filling faster, reducing the time to get to an orchard, having a larger capacity sprayer, and having a multi-row sprayer are the really big payoffs economically. And what I've done here is I took uh, Allison's numbers and I used David's calculator. I hope you can see all this. So here we have time spent spraying. I just threw in, sorry about the Canadiana, some kilometers an hour, uh, row spacing, spray volume, et cetera. I put $25 an hour as labor. The tractor cost at 10 bucks an hour. The sprayer cost for the tower at 10 bucks an hour. I just pulled out of my butt 25 minutes filling and mixing. Uh, travel time to and from the orchard will say an average 10 minutes, probably more. Uh, total time, that's 35. Turning time, which matters, 10 seconds a turn. Average row length, yada, yada, yada. Purchase cost, depreciation, repair and maintenance. I did this for a tower and the Munkoff. And uh, for the Munkoff, I used the greater cost of the sprayer. I extended how long it takes to turn, but I added in the fact that you can do three rows uh, at a time. Look at the work rate where my cursor is here in hectares per hour. For the tower, it's 2.3 hectares sprayed in an hour. Oh, sorry, my mistake. For the Munkoff, it's 2.3 hectares sprayed an hour. For the tower, it's 1.1. If you look at the cost per hectare, it's $24, I'm just guessing here, uh, per hectare to use the Munkoff and 41 for the tower. Allison's numbers played perfectly with what we would expect to see where labor and time are the huge uh, sucks uh, economically. So $236 to apply per for uh, the cost of the application for whatever that matters for the for the tower, I'm sorry, for the Munkoff and almost twice that for the tower. So if you have an architecture, a planting architecture that lends itself to multi-row applications, it is well worth running these numbers to see where those, those, those cost breaks are. And this calculator, and I shared the address in uh, our chat, is just so much fun to play with. Like if you wanna do a, a coffee or a beer moment and sit down and plug some numbers in and go, what would happen if I drove a little faster, really? What would happen if I could fill a little faster? Maybe if I got a tender truck or moved where my fill station is and I could reduce the time back and forth between blocks, does that make sense? You can just run these numbers until you're satisfied that something might be worth your time. So I, I just I just wanted to compliment Allison in grabbing all those numbers and uh, just corroborating loosely everything she said. It, it's just fascinating to me to see that the biggest payoff is multiple rows. So having said all that, let's just do this. Alt tab. Oop. Michael, are you seeing a chunks of a PowerPoint presentation now? I'm still seeing the spreadsheet. It's possible it's taking a little time to load, but well, I don't I'll think it's showing sharing. up on the new window. And I'll reshare. I can learn that lesson. How's that? Looks good. All right. I'm going to. <laughs> this is fun. I mean, we talk about progress. We talk about change. 
1956, these guys are unloading five megabytes of storage. <laughs> I got a key card here. That's 5,000 megabytes of storage, right? Five gigs. It's, it's unbelievable. Like, so when people ask me, where are we going? Who the hell knows? Who knew back then when they were unloading this beast, you know, what, where we would be today. But I was asked to, to give a talk like this. And I'm just going to push through here. If you consider precision to be detecting change, making a decision about change or variability, and then responding to it, I think that's fair for spraying. Because a, a lot of the times we talk about what is precision agriculture when it comes to spraying, we're always talking about sensors. Can they see a crop? Can they respond to where a crop is or isn't? And can they somehow change your flow rate to, to compensate so that you get a really tailored match between what you applied and where it was applied. That's, um, that's where a lot of people are running right now. And it's not new, you know, back in the late seventies, early eighties, we had ultrasonics for the very first time on sprayers in California. They were used to spray citrus and, uh, it was massive, you know, the uh, how much money they saved because these were big standalone trees that were as much a gap as they were a tree. So it simply didn't make any sense to spray where the tree wasn't. So as excited as we all are about these autonomous sprayers and these precise sprayers, I think it's important to remember to step back and think about what they're actually capable of doing. So uh, this slide is, talks about section level on and off sprayers. I can turn off the top third of my sprayer bank, nozzle bank, the middle or the bottom based on what's there. And people that are selling these sprayers are claiming massive savings in water and pesticide. And it does intuitively make sense not to spray what's there. But I, I like to tap the brakes a little bit on that because there's a lot of debate on whether we even should be doing this in some cases. For example, if you have a young orchard, or a young planting where there are gaps between each tree. Where do you actually turn the boom off? And where do you turn it back on in relation to that tree? This makes a big difference if you say, well, looking at the area that I have to spray in two dimensions, the tree's there half the time and it isn't. I could say 50% of my spray. If you turn that boom off too quickly, you miss all the spray that's supposed to get in between the trees and spray the leading and lagging edge. Likewise, if you turn it off too soon, you're missing some of that edge spray. And it's much easier to penetrate on the edges of the trees. There's not typically as much there. So that starts to nibble away at your savings. There's an argument that taller canopies, because the tallest, highest part of tall canopies tend to be the hardest places to hit. So if we picture it like um, sharp teeth peaks, you would think, well, God, you know, there's, there's nothing there, so I shouldn't be spraying there as often. Well, it takes time for a spray to reach the top of the tree, and it slows down before it gets there, and the odds of it getting deflected before it arrives is much higher than it would be right next to the sprayer. So there are some specialists that contend that don't ever turn off the top of the sprayer. If you haven't got enough sprayer capacity to reach it, it would be dangerous to do that. And for someone that's got continuous hedge-like rows, great panels or, or high density orchards that have filled in, you know, <laughs> there's almost always tree there. So these are considerations when someone's telling you, you're going to save a lot of money with precision egg that turns on and off the sprayer. Um, then we can go into nuance. Maybe we don't turn it on and off. Maybe we modulate the flow based on how much canopy is there. I got 50% canopy, maybe I only need 50% as much spray, which is sort of where tree row volume originally came from. And right now in Ontario, we've had for a couple of years, some of the smart guided sprayers. Here's one with LIDAR that's been built onto the front of a turbo mist. And the idea here is it releases a certain amount of liquid for however much density of canopy it detects. And um, to the best of my knowledge, this has been running it's been here for two years now consistently, and I don't know what kind of success they've had using it. It took so long to get it set up and calibrated co correctly. Um, 
that I think they kind of ran at a time, at least in that first year. And they said, you know, the hell with it. We're just going to use it as a conventional sprayer. No harm, no foul till we can figure it out. And part of the dialing in of this system is coordinating where the LIDAR detects the canopy, which nozzles correspond to that part of the canopy, and how much you actually should spray when you see it. So I think this comes with so many ounces per whatever density. Like there's a standard that's plugged into it, and they recommend the grower uh, check that out, calibrate it, and adjust it based on the whatever outcome they get. I'm not being clear about that. This thing is guessing how much liquid needs to be released for how much canopy. But there are a lot of things that happen from the point that it's released from the nozzle to where hopefully it arrives at the canopy that you've got to compensate for somehow. So I'm just going to continue to tap the brakes here and just share this. With LIDAR, you're capable of like sub 10, 10 centimeter resolution, which is pretty exciting. Like you, you should be able to dial this in really well. But at the core of these sprayers, they assume that the only change you need to make for however much canopy is there is how much liquid you release. And I, I don't believe that's true. In fact, I think the air handling might be as fundamental or perhaps more fundamental than how much liquid is released or spray mix in relation to the canopy. So these sprayers might give a false sense of confidence to a grower that's invested in them that you could use maybe more untrained labor. Okay, this sprayer, all that person has to do really is just drive it till it's empty and the sprayer will make all the hard decisions. No, the sprayer will detect the canopy and release a certain amount of liquid, but it doesn't know that the wind picked up. It doesn't know that it's really dry outside and a lot of the finer spray will evaporate before it ever gets there. Uh, it doesn't know that for a given travel speed, maybe your sprayer doesn't blow enough air and you're driving a bit too quick and you're not penetrating the canopy as well as you would think or vice versa. It does know how far away it is from the target. That's one of the things LiDAR can do and any of the sensors, but it really doesn't know what to do about it because it doesn't know how much spray is lost before it arrives. <clears throat> There's the number. Uh, I think these spraying systems come with 1.2 fluid ounces per cubic foot of canopy. What does that mean? You know, so many people have dialed this in in the past. They've doubled it. They've halved it. This doesn't absolve the operator from looking to see if they've achieved their goal. And the real um, tough thing when you're when you're working out these efficiency spreadsheets is how much do you need to mix? Like at the beginning of the season, you got a pile of sticks. You're you're not going to need quite so much volume. At the end of the season, you have so much more canopy you're going to need more volume. So how do you predict how much spray mix to put in the sprayer? What do you do if you've got 250 gallons of spray left over? Like, where does that go? So it's pretty tricky to figure that out. Um, as they continue to evolve, and we've been chasing, I say we, uh, engineers have been chasing this for a while. What's really missing is closing this loop. Yes, the sprayer can detect a canopy, and yes, it can release a certain amount of liquid in relation to that, but no, it can't adjust the air, not all of them anyway, to compensate. And there's no way to know if it actually got there. What would be ideal? Would it be have some kind of digital sensor in the canopy that can report back, take advantage of machine learning? I pitched this much. What did you catch? I didn't catch anything. Ooh, all right. I need to slow down or release more liquid or something needs to be you know, addressed here. Or I got drenched. Well, I didn't need to drench you, so I can back it off. And from moment to moment, the machine can sort of touch base with these sensors, perhaps positioned in different rows in the canopy or in, the, in a block and permanently and make changes on the fly. They called it a digital apple. I think Andrew Landers was looking at that. I know in New Zealand and California and Australia, there are at least three different groups that are trying independently to come up with some sort of digital sensor. And, you know, it's the machine vision part that excites me more than the potential savings or tailoring the spray to match the canopy. And it's not because of how much product is being released. It's because of what you can learn about the job that you're doing and your crop while you're spraying anyway. You're out there 20 times in a block. Imagine what you can learn. 
when I was in Australia, I got to go to Swarm Farm and I got to see some of their autonomous platform systems. And this, it's been a few years and it's changing quick. But at the time they were doing what everybody's trying to do, um, do targeted identification on crop, crop physiology. So in grapes, they could identify a fruit zone and only spray where there were grapes. Um, but also with this incredible optic system, they can identify pests. They're getting better at that, certainly in weed ID and field crops uh, and damage. They can identify damage and that can tell the sprayer not to spray because there's canopy, but to spray because there are pests or damage in certain spots. That may or may not happen, but certainly bloom detection is underway for crop load management. Uh, that's what this image is showing. They've sort of uh, identified which trees have a certain amount of uh, bloom, and that's supposed to be part of um, a tailored prescription treatment for, for thinning. And everyone's chasing that right now. And uh, I don't know enough about it, but I know it's it's coming. Uh, vigor is also really interesting. As you're driving your tractor back and forth, your sprayer is picking up information about which trees are maybe nutrient deficient just based on the, the fluorescence of the leaves themselves. So you can do custom nutrient application. I know uh, some of these fluorescence systems are also capable of picking up just the suckers. So why don't we just spray the suckers uh, from the sprayer while we're driving instead of having manual people or, or doing it broadcast. So these mounted sensors, great. You know, they can detect how much product to release, but look at everything else they can learn. And you can even go back and look at crop load, right? Did my thinning actually match harvest? And that can be traced all the way through. That's kind of exciting. In Ontario, we're working hard with autonomy. We all are. So all of these sprayers, uh, all of these droids seem to have the same manufacturer's idea. It's a it's an autonomous platform, and then you just put an implement on it. And we are slowly coming up on, I would say, level three here, uh, driver assisted. We're still in a position where the sprayers don't respond to the environment. Uh, they do respond to not hitting things, these autonomous sprayers. They can't quite do a prescription application yet. They are starting collateral data acquisition where you can you know, count blooms and do things like that. Um, but we are certainly not at the point where we can step back. We're kind of touching on operators supervised. And I'll get to that in a second. It's going to be really neat when the operator sets this sprayer on its task. And then it comes and fuels and fills itself up. In the case of some sprayers, we could even talk about novel traffic patterns. Drones don't need to fly in straight lines if they don't have to. So that's where the, the more the precision application might also enter autonomy. But we're a long way from full autonomy where there's a coordinated fleet that's just taking care of itself and communicating with itself. So I'm, I'm still trying to figure this slide out. Um, the balance isn't quite there yet, but it, I think it captures a lot of the different aspects that we have our eye on for automation and precision. We know about Gus, it's, it was probably, I think it was the first commercially available uh, air blast sprayer that was autonomous. But in all honesty, it's a stupid sprayer. The, it, it's a tank, it drives and it doesn't hit things, but that's all it did. It still required the operator to set it up for the conditions that it was spraying under. And um, don't think for a moment that you're absolved of doing that. The new minis, they're better for things like grapes and smaller crops, but all of them now have optic sensors that are very similar to Smart Apply, almost exactly, in fact. And they're now capable of driving autonomously and making decisions on what's sprayed. I'd love to get my hands on this one. I still haven't seen it in person. It's out of Brazil. This autonomous sprayer is by Jacto. Not only does it change how much uh, flow is released per minute based on canopy, ostensibly it can change how hard it blows. And I don't know what it's measuring to decide how hard to blow because it's a bit tricky how fast you drive and how much canopy is there. And the wind conditions all play a role in whether or not you got into the crop, but they say they can do it. And just recently, um, this landed. I cannot wait to play with this. I'll be fiddling with this all summer long. This is uh, HSS's ISA sprayer on the back there. It's weeded sensors, which are fluorescent based and you know they're pulse width modulation. They're gonna release a certain amount of product per minute based on canopy. And it's strapped onto a, a, an AG-Z autonomous unit. 
but they're calling this the AgBot. And uh, it does something that none of the other sprayers to the best of my knowledge can do. If you look to the top right, you see that little green funnel? This sucker can fill itself up. So I don't know how that's going to work. I haven't seen the fill unit yet, but apparently it drives up, fills up and carries on. Now, I don't know if you're supposed to mix everything for the whole day and just have that sloshing around like a swimming pool on a block. I don't like that idea. I don't know what safeties need to be in place. I don't know how you even decide how much you're going to need since week to week, this should be spraying more and more liquid. But I guess we're going to find out. We'll look at it this year. And I love the joystick. I mean, anyone who has kids that just spend all their day playing PlayStation, finally, you know, give them a slap on the back. They've been training for years. Look at this thing. It's just like an Xbox or a, a Sony PlayStation joystick. And this whole unit is just festooned with emergency stop buttons. Anywhere you're next to this, you can slap a red button and it'll it'll stop. So we're going to be looking at some of the economics this year in an orchard. But I think we're also going to look at the practicalities. How often do you have to go bail this thing out? Can it cross the street between blocks? And if not, is there really labor savings if you have to walk along and babysit it? Um, how much product are you going to waste? How much product are you going to save? We don't know. We have no idea. What, what if there are repairs? How quickly can someone come out? And it's not going to be a guy with a wrench, I don't think. So we don't know any of that at this point, but we've got some real courageous growers that are going to give it a shot. And what time is it here? I'm just rambling. We are a little over time, Jason. We're over. So we can go yep. ahead and start wrapping up. I will wrap up. Um, this is kind of another sort of precision and automation. And we're doing a lot of work with this right now, trying to figure out where the spray goes, what it looks like, how much we can expect as far as coverage and efficacy. And there are so many fundamental things we don't know about drones. Uh, some people are massive proponents and others just say it'll never fly, no pun intended. I'm going to call myself a skeptic. And I'm gonna call myself a skeptic because of this image. This is relative indexing. If you look to the bottom right of that tree, I'm sorry, the top right, you see, we'll say 1x. That portion of the tree received 1x worth of coverage. Because of where the spray is released and how much air there is and air energy, at the bottom of the tree, you would expect to get three times the deposition as you would at the top on the leading side. On the far side, it's a whole different story. The canopy just filters all the spray out. This, by the way, is why I don't like alternate row spraying. Certainly not with a sprayer that isn't designed to do it. So now if we were just kind of take this air blast sprayer and suspend it over the top of a canopy, what kind of coverage would you expect? It does have air assist. It, it can't be helped. It's always blowing. So it will force spray down. And there have been records of deposits all the way through almond orchards, which is incredible when you think how big and dense those trees are. But it's unpredictable. And there's so little volume that I don't know if it'll ever be viable for anything but some sort of spot spraying, some sort of pest related or bloom related, something specific, specifically targeted, not like a broadcast, but I'm prepared to be wrong. So I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm just saying it's exciting. We, we don't know how these are actually going to play out as far as labor savings and financial savings. Um, we're gonna move from generalist labor to much more highly trained labor. I don't know what that's going to end up costing, but I, I just want to leave the group knowing that if you get a sprayer that claims to be smart, it, it isn't, not yet. You're still required to confirm that it's doing what it thinks it's doing. It has no self-diagnosing systems, really, and it has no way of knowing whether it's achieved its goals. You still have to dial it in and double check that. So cautious optimism, I think, is what I would say with precision ag. The biggest thing you can do to save money right now and be more precise is what Allison said. Use a multiple row sprayer to save on labor. All right, thank you, Jason. I think, yeah, that is the, the takeaway for now. I think Allison has the, the data to show us. And if you could send us a copy also of that, that spray uh, calculator worksheet that you showed, 
I'd love to have a, a version of that too to play around with as well. So I think with that, we are 10 minutes over. I'm sure everybody has other places they need to be today. So I'd like to thank uh, Jason and Allison. Thank you both so much for taking the time to, to prep for this and to speak with us today. And thank you all for joining us. We do have our last meeting next Wednesday, same time. I believe we're going to be talking about the reemergence of minor pests, things like woolly apple aphids and a few others that we're starting to see becoming more problematic again. So be sure to join us next week if you're able to. And we'll see you then. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Mike. Thanks Thank everybody. You. That was great.